Hey everyone, welcome back to The Bookworm. I'm Dimitri, and today we're going to talk about my favorite books of 2021. Uh, so let's get started. Number 10, uh, Inherent Vice by Thomas Pynchon. Um, I did a review of this earlier this year on my channel. Um, I recommend checking that out. But kind of my quick hot takes on Inherent Vice. Um, I liked it, obviously. It's my number 10. Uh, but I didn't love it compared to the other Pynchon novels I've picked up. A lot of people will say that this is the uh, best starting point for Pynchon, um, if you're curious, if you're Pynchon curious. Uh, but I would not recommend it. Um, it's considered Pynchon light or one of the easier Pynchon books to pick up. Um, but if you're not sure about Pynchon, I would recommend his other books. Um, the, the reason behind that is this was fun and there were some really cool ideas in here. But it just felt ultimately less genius than his other books. Um, and if you're going into Pynchon, if you're curious about Pynchon, I don't think you necessarily want an easy ride. I still think if you like Pynchon, you should definitely read this eventually. It's worthwhile. You get a, uh, you know, more Pynchon hijinks and, and, and fun and flavor and stuff. But if you're new to Pynchon, pick up Crying of Lot 49. It's a smaller book, yeah. But it's also pretty dense and, and genius and it's a challenge and I think th those are all you know real reasons why people want to pick up Pynchon. I don't think they go in it for an easy read so to speak. Um, but I, yeah like I said I think he has really great ideas about the American dream, um, about California specifically but about America uh, and the loss of the hippie era. Um, so really interesting ideas uh, fleshed out here. I just wanted a little bit more. And also just noticing that uh, my shirt matches the, the book. Not intentional, but cool. All right, next on my list, coming in at number nine, is Dune. Um, I finally picked this book up after, you know, years and years. I think ever since middle school, when I first heard about Dune, I've wanted to read it. And I, I can truly say it lives up to its name. Um, I'm not a huge sci-fi fantasy person, so that's probably why it's not higher on my list. Uh, but I still liked it, and I can appreciate it for what it is and, and for how influ influential it is. Um, I ultimately love this the most for its world building, um, just how detailed the world that Frank Herbert built uh, is in this. Um, some people really like the, uh, is it the third book or the third part in here a lot, the last couple hundred pages, book three within the book. Um, that was maybe my, my least favorite. Um, there was a lot of action scenes, sure, but they felt kind of predictable. Um, I felt like the beginning of the book was more fun for me because that's when everything's being built up and is unpredictable and you're kind of just thrown into this world um, and you're picking up the pieces as you go. It's it's wildly uh, intricate, yet still easily readable and easy to, to comprehend. And that balance is really, really uh, quite amazing, quite an amazing feat. Um, so, yeah, I really loved it. I loved it more for the beginning and middle than I did for the end, which just felt like the dominoes kind of falling to pieces, which I guess is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just not what I enjoyed the most, right? Um, there's that. Next on my list, coming in at number eight, All the Pretty Horses by Cormac McCarthy. This is actually my first Cormac McCarthy book that I've read. I fake read it in high school and, uh, you know, regretted it. I watched the movie and took the quiz and did okay on it, but um, I wanted to actually read it this time. So picked it up, um, did a little book club with a friend over... Um, COVID and uh, really, really enjoyed it. Um, I loved, you know, the action, the kind of Hemingway-like description of movements, the lack of grammar. He has such a refined style, uh, definitely not uh, a style for uh, the, the grammar uh, police people, but, but this is uh, just really captivating. Sometimes the dialogue is confusing, but I think it really brings you in. Um, so I really loved it for that. Um, I love the philosophy in here. He has a really well-defined and well-refined philosophy of this kind of godless world and this intense realism, which I've heard is kind of in all Cormac McCarthy books. I've heard this is Cormac McCarthy light, um, like his brightest and breeziest novel. 
um, where his other ones are a lot heavier. Uh, what I particularly liked was the kind of interplay between Dreamer versus Reality. Um, the main character in here kind of felt like a Don Quixote or a Madame Bovary character that kind of has this dream that envelops their life and they feel like they're living this fantasy. Uh, so the main character in here has heard these cowboy stories growing up and he's trying to live this fantasy of being a cowboy, uh, even though in the background the world is being replaced um, the world is replacing horses with automobiles and the way of the cowboy is going away and it's not really his true identity and, and, and whatnot and he's kind of holding on to that. My friend and I had some really interesting conversations about uh, the point of violence in this book and sometimes it just feels like it's put in there for fun and it is fun uh, but I also think it brings out the high realism that he's going for. Um, that, you know, that's kind of an unfinished spot, which is fine for me to leave it there. Next on my list was Trick Mirror by Gia Tolentino. She's a New Yorker writer, and this is a uh, book of essays. I kind of got on a essay kick when I was uh, starting off 2021. I was reading a bunch of essay collections, and this was my favorite that I, I read. Um, this is all about, I mean, it's about so many things. Um, it's about identity in our internet era. I think that's the simplest way of putting it. Um, she has a great, I think, you know, the, the eye in the internet is one of her best essays in here. She has a really great essay that's about athleisure, the, the type of wear, wearing sweatpants and yoga pants all the time, uh, as kind of an, an, a symbolic representation of late stage capitalism. That's a really fun essay. She has another essay about God and Houston rap. Um, one on reality TV when she was on the reality TV show and how that's kind of analogous to how we all live with a different personality online. Um, she circles around so many fascinating ideas within just one essay that sometimes it's hard to find the center, the, the exact point she's trying to make, but it's also half the fun. Um, so highly recommend Gia Tolentini, Tolentino's sorry, uh, Trick Mirror. Uh, kind of on that internet theme, which was how I started off the, the year, um, I also read the graphic novel Sabrina. Um, this was recommended to me um, as a um, comparison point to Chris Ware. I really like Jimmy Corrigan, Rusty Brown, building stories by Chris Ware, and his style is very similar to Chris's. Um, I think they're actually friends. He wrote a... Uh, yeah. Um, this book is in one word is about the internet. Um, I've never had a book, a fiction book at least, uh, cover the feeling of what it's like to live online or saturated in, a, in an environment that is surrounded by online culture uh, better than this book. Um, it's a, not necessarily a murder mystery, but it follows the aftermath of kind of um, an abduction of sorts. And... Uh, it's, it's um, about fake news, the internet, and kind of the, the violence that's uh, endemic in, in, in both of those, in, in fake news and in, in the internet. Um, violence to thoughts and ideas, but also the physical violence behind it. Highly recommend this book. It's, you know, it's a graphic novel, so you can read it quick if you want to, but recommend uh, taking your time with this one. Um, all right, now we're in the top five. Number five was Bluets or Bluey. Um, by Maggie Nelson. I guess both are correct ways of pronouncing it. Um, she references both ways of pronouncing it in the book, so I'm going to pronounce it Bluettes because it's easier for me to say. Um, but this is about falling in love with the color blue. Um, there's a character in here that is Mr. Blue. Um, and Maggie Nelson became my favorite, one of my favorite living authors after I read uh, The Argonauts by her. I have a review of that book on this channel. And so I picked up this book and I picked up a few more by her uh, more recently. And I just really love the kind of philosophy on the color blue um, and the feeling blue and the music blue and how she interweaves all these different ideas. Um, and also um, her musings on love. She has such a unique way of interweaving autobiography with uh, philosophy and critical theory um, in, in such a way that I've not quite seen um, as fresh as this. 
so highly, highly recommend this book. All right, uh, here's a newer book on my list. Um, I guess those last couple uh, were also new-ish, but this one came out last year. Um, Crying in H Mart, Mart by Michelle Zahner. It's also the reason why I'm wearing uh, my B-Suite Japanese breakfast uh, t-shirt. Um, so this was written by Michelle Zahner. She's the artist behind the uh, indie rock band uh, Japanese Breakfast. Um, and I absolutely love this book. Um, it's her memoir um, about being a caretaker for her mom who um, had pretty rapid advancing cancer. Um, and it's about being a caretaker in a physical but also uh, mental and emotional state. Uh, physically caring for someone, but also um, care, caring for their stories and, and, and passing on their stories. Um, her mother was from Korea, um, and she now realizes, since she doesn't have the language anymore, that she has to, you know, now that her mom's gone, she, she is the one that's responsible for carrying the torture or bringing um, the culture forward to the next generation, um, to her kids, right? Um, and so that feeling, that realization that the culture can't die with you, I think is incredibly relatable um, to a lot of Americans. And she, she places that really well, but also just caretaking the stories of people that um, have passed in your life. Um, not ashamed to say that I, every day that I read this book, I cried a little. It's, it's incredibly emotional. Um, it's also really fun um, because she ties into a lot of the music that she writes. You can come into this not knowing anything about Japanese breakfast. But, but once you start reading it, uh, playing some Japanese breakfast really kind of highlights. It's like having a soundtrack to your book. It's really cool. Um, absolutely love this book. I've heard a lot of people, you know, knowing her first as an author and, and now second as a um, musician. Um, uh, if this was a music review, her album this year would also be kind of um, at least in my top two albums of the year. I haven't quite decided yet. Um, but Jubilee by Japanese Breakfast, I think really kind of encapsulates what we wanted 2021 to feel like um, as kind of this celebration and re-entry into society, but still kind of mourning over the wild year that we had in 2020 and the things that we lost in 2020. Um, that's an unfinished thought, but I love this book, number four. All right, what's my number three? Number three is How to Do Nothing. I have another video about that on my channel. Unfortunately, I don't have the book right here. Um, I actually taught a lesson on How to Do Nothing uh, for my students. Um, I'm, I'm an English teacher, and so that's sitting in my classroom, and I forgot to bring it home for this. Um, but How to Do Nothing is kind of this uh, philosophical take. It's how to unplug from the attention economy. I hate the title of it. But the philosophy behind it is, is very well versed. She's a Stanford professor and a artist that lives in Oakland. And uh, this book shifted the way I think about productivity. Um, I think we all had this anxiety or I really felt this anxiety during the pandemic that I have to do this and do that. And sitting at home, I wasn't being as productive. Um, but this allowed me, uh, it, it, it gave me permission to be alone with my thoughts, to, to reflect on things and take my time with things. And, and that's something that um, will always stay with me. Um, I, I love, love that book. All right, we're, we're almost done. We're nearing the end. Homeland Elegies hits number two. This book also came out in 2020, I believe, or maybe 2021. Um, I've never, I have a, also another review of this on my channel. Um, Ayad Akhtar wrote this really beautiful, amazing book. Um, it's about uh, so many different things. I've never had a book play with my emotions or my trust more than this. He has such an interesting way of interweaving um, his own personal facts about his life, uh, kind of autobiographical, with fiction. And he really blurs the line between fact and fiction. He actually is pretty um, hesitant to release any real information, saying what's true and what's not. But there's so many details that are definitely true and then some that are definitely false. And it's, you know, everything in between, you're not sure what to believe and what not to believe. And, and that was super fun. Uh, it's really what it feels like to live in a post-Trump 
uh, alternative fact kind of America, um, even a post 9-11 world, um, it's, yeah, I've never had my trust pull that more than with this book, but I, I loved it. I was a glutton for punishment. It was fun. Uh, before I get to my number one book of the year, I want to do some honorable mentions. Um, kind of on that, that uh, essay kick, I read George Saunders' The Brain Dead Microphone, uh, Megaphone, sorry. Um, this is his nonfiction collection of essays. Um, it was really fun. I enjoyed it. It's just not his best. Um, he's better as a short story writer, but uh, he definitely has really great essays. I love the one he has on um, Mark Twain, I remember really liking, um, and Mr. Vonnegut, uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Those were really good to get an idea of uh, his um, understanding of uh, his writer aesthetic. Uh, the title one, The Brain Dead Megaphone, is really good about the effect of news. It's kind of the medium is the message kind of essay. Um, I read Alan Moore's From Hell. Um, this was really cool. Uh, his kind of theory that um, Jack the Ripper, his storytelling of Jack the Ripper and all the conspiracy theories behind it um, is really the, really the birth of the 21st century, um, as we can kind of see here. Um, this is Jack the Ripper like having a flash of the future and seeing these skyscrapers and uh, foretelling the future. Um, it's pretty trippy. I know they recently released it in color, um, but I, I kind of like the aesthetic of the original, just black and white. Um, it's a pretty disturbing book, um, and that is maybe why it's not on my top 10. I don't like true crime things, and I don't like... Uh, gruesome murder things um, and this is all of that but it's it's fun and it's good and the conspiracy theories in it are fun and seemingly well researched although I think they've all been debunked um, it's, a, it's a fun read um, and last thing not an honorable mention honorable dismension I reread The Call of the Wild when I went to uh, Alaska this year and I decided I don't like this book. Uh, Call of the Wild just felt, uh, I mean, I read it in middle school and it felt like this should be read in middle school. I thought I would come back to it with a new appreciation and um, living in near Oakland uh, with Jack London Square that I would maybe start to like Jack London's work. Uh, let me know if you like other pieces by Jack London, but I just, I did not like this. Um, and we're here. Number one, my favorite book of the year was In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust. Um, I am almost done with it, um, but I will finish it by the end of the year. So I'm just going to say it's my favorite book because I only have a couple hundred more pages left out of the 4,000 that I've already read. So this is my favorite book of the year. Um, I'll definitely have a larger review about this later. Um, Ultimately, I, I didn't love the first book when I read it, but I knew there was something there, so I decided to buy the, the whole slipcase. Um, but uh, Swan's Way was just kind of mad to me, um, but I've grown to appreciate it more now that I've kind of understood its place. It has a lot of false starts and has three si seemingly different stories going on, and you, I, I just didn't know what direction to go in. But uh, book two really... Um, really sucked me in and, and sold me on, on the entire series, or the one book, because uh, it's all considered one novel, right? Um, and I've loved every volume since, and it's it's been an amazing uh, an amazing journey that I think will, will stick with me. It's, it's been one of the more challenging uh, reading things that I've done, reading tasks, uh, purely because of its sheer size and it's really hard to read anything else but Proust uh, because it, it demands a lot of your attention. Um, I guess I wouldn't say it's hard but it's demanding if that makes sense. Um, but more on that um, I think ultimately it's about uh, how time and habit are the great destroyers in the world and so how do you limit how time affects you and how do you limit how habit can affect you so that you, you can appreciate life more. The easy answer is art. But there's a lot of other kind of distracting elements that might try to um, uh, replace art in your life. 
um, social climbing, uh, falling in love. These are distractions to what it, what is more pure, which is art, which allows you to see things new for the first time and, and whatnot. So that's my at a glance idea going right now, but but more on that later. Anyways, these were my favorite books. What did you think? Did you like any of the books that I read? After I finish Proust, I want to read only small books. Um, so if you have any good graphic novels, books close to or under 200 pages, let me know. I just want to read small books for a while. Um, I don't know if I can handle um, another big book in you know, the beginning of the next new year. So let me know what you think. Anyways, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time, whenever that might be. Bye.